morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Glad to see several of you joining on here and hope that you are all doing well today and are ready for our Bible study. So we've been walking through the book of Luke, looking at the life of Christ, and today we're going to look at the second half of chapter 7. So I started chapter 7 yesterday. It's 50 verses long, which is in and of itself a lot of ground to cover. But when you get when I get to chapter up to verse 36 of this chapter there's really to me there's time to slow down and look at some things here that are in this text. To me when I'm looking at Luke 7 verses 36 through 50 it's all about forgiveness and man's need for forgiveness in general. We all need it. Um I don't really know how to I'm not going to go into what's going on in our country right now. That's not my point, but I think it illustrates some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Man's need for forgiveness. That's all I'm going to say about that. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. So here's what I've done. I've divided this up, divided this up into a few different points. Normally I just break the cha chapter up into a few points, but today I want to break this section of this cha chapter up into a few points. And we'll read the text as we go along, and then we'll come back through and make some comments. If you have any questions or comments as this is going, please feel free to add it in here in the comments section. If you have a question, throw it in there. You can send me a private message. However you want to do it, it doesn't matter to me. But uh, I want you to always feel free to say something. And uh, even if it's something in terms of disagreement, we can talk about it, and we'll go to what the Bible says, because, uh, frankly, that's all that matters. All right, Luke 7, 36 through 50. So... In verses 36 through 38, we have Jesus being invited somewhere. And uh, so here's what the text says. Then one of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alab alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Uh, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So that's quite, I mean, that is quite a scene. Now, one thing that I do want to point out as we are looking at these few verses is, and th so this is something I've done through this whole section, verses 36 through 50, is circle the, the information about this woman. Here's one thing I want to go ahead and say. We don't know who this woman was. We know who this Pharisee was. If you look down at verse 40, we find out that his name is Simon. We are never told who this woman is. There are some, you know, there's speculation. This is not the same anointing that we read about in John chapter 12 where Jesus is at Bethany. This is a different situation, and we're never told who this woman is. So that's all I'm going to say about that. We know uh, from verse 37, she's a sinner. Um... You go down to verse 39, she is a sinner. You go down to verse, um, well, really, when Jesus begins going into further teaching, verse 44, she is mentioned in verse 44, this woman, verse 45, this woman, verse 46, her sins are many, verse 47, her sins are forgiven, verse 49, and your faith has saved you, verse 50. So throughout this text, she's mentioned in a variety of ways. But here's the invitation, and here's what happens. He goes to Simon the Pharisee's house, and when he's there, a woman who is a sinner comes, anoints his feet, and uh, wipes them with the hair of her head. Simon has a thought, and this really displays the mindset of the Pharisees. I mean, it, their, their mindset is displayed time and time again throughout the gospel accounts, but here's just one more instance of their pattern of thinking, I guess, that is the best way to put it. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw, uh, saw this, he's witnessing what she's doing. I, ha I have this circled in my Bible. He spoke to himself. He's not talking out loud here. And many times that's the way it occurs in the Gospels. They'll think to themselves. They'll reason within themselves. Well, he spoke to himself saying, this man, all right, Jesus, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I mean, this is how the Pharisees saw everything in regard to Jesus. If he knew what type of people he was with, he wouldn't be around them. 
they're sinners. I mean, you can go to, and Luke does this quite often. Probably the most well-known text is Luke chapter 15. Uh, the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained. They're complaining that sinners are coming to hear the Son of God. That just is, a, is a, a quick summation. That's a quick commentary on their life. Pharisees were separatists. They thought they were above everybody. So here's Simon's thought, Luke 7, verse 39. Jesus has a response, though, to that thought. Like I said, we're just going to read through We're going to break this down. We're going to read through it. Then we'll come back and make comment. Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing, and this is important here, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon responds to that in verse 42 here. Or, or I'm sorry, verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. So there's Jesus' response. And uh, I see people keep joining. Hey, good morning, Lee. Good to see you on here today. So now we have verses 43 through 50. Let's talk about forgiveness. So again, let's read the text, then we'll come back and make comment. Really beginning in verse 44. He turns to the woman. So this, he's had this interaction with Simon, who had this thought, if he, if he is who he claims to be, he wouldn't be around this woman. So now he turns to the woman. Do you see this woman talking to Simon? I entered your house, Simon. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. He said, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All right, so now let's run back through here and make some comment. Again, first of all, one of the things I note in all of these verses, verses 36 through 50, is the woman, the, the mention of her appears throughout the text. Uh, verse 37, verse 39, then you jump down to verse um, 44 through 50. She's mentioned time and time again. And her condition is mentioned time and time again. Good morning, Debbie. So what do we learn here? What do we learn about forgiveness? What do we learn about, and, and while this word is not used in this text, but what do we learn about grace here? Man's need for not only forgiveness, but for grace as well. The fact that she was a sinner, again, is mentioned time and time again. That's not insignificant. We're never told who she was. Simon's thinking something to himself. He never says it out loud, but Jesus brings out what Simon was thinking. So in that interaction with Simon, Jesus um, essentially tells a parable. He, he tells an gives an illustration here, beginning in verse 41. He talks about a creditor. Well, that would be, symbolically, that would be him, or perhaps God, God the Father. He has, th this creditor has two people who are indebted. One is ten times as in debt as the other. So, who, you know, and... So who would be more appreciative of forgiveness? It wouldn't be that the that the person who owed this creditor um, 50 denarii, verse 41, it's not that he wouldn't be thankful. You know, if you're forgiven a debt that you can't pay, I'd be thankful for that. It wouldn't matter how much. I'd be really appreciative of if I owed somebody 10 bucks and they said, oh, don't worry about it. I would really appreciate that. Imagine owing someone $1,000. And they say, well, you know what? Don't worry about it. It's, it's not that I wouldn't be thankful for having been forgiven of a $10 debt, but $1,000 or, you know, even $100, that would take it to a whole nother level. Um, but I want, what I want you to notice here in verse, what's, is what's said in verse 42. And when they, these both debtors, the 500 denarii and the 50 denarii, when they had nothing with which to repay... And here, to me, this is the center of this entire text. This is what it's all about. 
Jesus has gone into the house of a Pharisee, probably a well-off man, a man who is, um, well, I mean, as a Pharisee, he would be one who is spiritually inclined, okay? He would know the law. He would be one who, who perhaps in the sight of other Pharisees or other religiously minded Jewish people would be uh, respectable, someone who knew the Old Testament. And then this woman shows up on the scene who obviously, I mean, when you look at the text here, um, verse 39, if, if, he knew, if he were a prophet, he would know who this woman is and what type of woman she was because she is a sinner. So obviously this woman had a reputation in the community. Apparently, the way I see it, Simon knew who she was and Simon knew that she was a sinner. I wonder what Simon ever did to get her out of that sin. That's a thought that entered my mind. What, you know, what, what has he done to get, if, if he feels that she is such a sinner that she shouldn't even be in the same house with Jesus, what has she, what has Simon as a Pharisee done to help her? But I think this, I think the phrase in verse 42 kind of centers this whole discussion. These two people who were in debt had nothing with which to repay the one who made the loan, the creditor. This is a picture of man's relationship to God. You know, if you're outside of Christ, if a person has never been baptized into Christ, they are lost in sin, period. They may not be a terrible, wicked, murdering, you know, you think of all the terrible sins that we call, the way we, the way we as humans classify sin. You may just never have obeyed the gospel. Maybe... A person be a religious person, but they've never obeyed the gospel. They're still outside of Christ, just as much as a person who is, again, what we would consider a terrible, um, evil, wicked sinner. They're both in debt to God. They're not in debt, but they're... they're That doesn't, if, if you're lost, you're lost. There's no state of what I would say being a little bit lost and being a lot lost. But the fact of the matter is, there is nothing, and I want to say this carefully, I want to say it appropriately. I've got it written here in the written margin by Bible, I'll just read it. We cannot, man cannot save himself apart from obeying Jesus. This Pharisee needed Jesus just as much as this woman who was a sinner needed Jesus. But I think, I, the, the way I read this text, from her being the 500 denarii in debt, she appreciated that fact more than the Pharisee who knew the biblical text, who knew the Old Testament scrolls. He didn't see it that way. The Pharisee didn't see it that way. But the woman did. We, as humans, we cannot save ourselves apart from, and that's important to note, apart from a trusting, obedient faith in Jesus Christ. This woman had to turn to Jesus in order for her sins to be forgiven. And that's it's pronounced to her down in verse 48. She came to him in humility. She obviously knew who he was, what type of man he was, that, you know, as Simon called him a prophet, she knew something about Jesus. And his response to her is, your sins are forgiven. So let's think about that for a few minutes. Simon was la one thing that Simon was lacking was introspection. He failed to look at himself, and you know I think as humans we we're all capable of that, lacking introspection, a failure to look at self. You know it's so easy to look at our fellow human and say, "Hey, they need to fix this. They need to change this. I wish they wouldn't or would do this." That is so easy. But when we turn the mirror on ourselves, it's not so easy. And that, I mean, that goes for me. That goes for all of us. You know, uh, James, just for instance, James chapter 1 talks about the fact that um, the Word of God is like a mirror. We need to hold it up in front of ourselves and, and have some introspection here. This man, Simon, as you're reading the text here, Jesus is a guest in his house. Simon did nothing that was a common 
um, hospitable practice in that day. He didn't do one thing, and that's what Jesus points out. You didn't do this, here's what this woman did. You didn't do this, she did. You didn't do this, she did. Um, he lacked the ability to look at himself and see himself for what he truly was. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace, verse 50. Her actions manifested her faith. That's the key here. Her actions manifested her faith. So many people, I think, in in Christendom, and, and when I use that word, most of the time when I use the word Christianity or Christendom, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the world at large that says, I believe in God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm not talking about New Testament Christians, just those who confess some concept of Christianity. That's what I mean here. When we're talking about Christendom, the concept of faith a lot of times is very shallow, and it's just, um, I believe in Jesus. Jesus uh, came here, he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. Most people in that realm just view faith as that. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. And we don't question that. We don't question their love or their motives or anything like that. Biblical faith, faith that is approved of by God, is always active. It's never just saying, yes, I believe in God. I know James 2 is used a lot. Of course, we think of James chapter 2 and verse 19, the devils believe and tremble, the demons believe and tremble. Um, the only time the phrase faith only is used is in James chapter 2, and it says a man is not justified by faith alone. Faith without works is dead, period. But this woman here in Luke 7, verses 36 through 50, her actions manifested her faith. And in that, Jesus could say, your sins are forgiven. So that same thing has to be true of us today. So I've got a good comment here. Closed hearts are the most dangerous of all spiritual conditions. True obedience must be preceded by a broken and contrite heart. That's an excellent point. So thank you for that comment. Um, and it brings a passage to mind. Hmm. A passage that has just left me. <laughs> it's in the book of Psalms. If you read the book of Psalms, you will find it. I was thinking it was in Psalm chapter 57. Um, but about a broken and contrite heart. If any of you know that reference, throw it in the, co throw it in the comments here. And I would appreciate it because I can't, I can't think of it at the moment. Thank you. I can't think of it at the moment. So if you can, throw it in here. But that's, that's what God is... You, so here's another way to put it. You can't, we know what a know-it-all is. You can't teach a know-it-all anything, can you? You can't, they know it all. Well, in, in, in the same sense, a person who is, who, as this commenter says here, has a closed heart. Um, Psalm 51, that may be it, Lee. I don't have time to sit here and read all the Psalms to figure it out, but... Uh, a wicked and contrite heart, the Lord will not turn away. Let me flip over to Psalm 51 real quick and give that a quick perusal. Ah, thank you. Lee Davis, you hit the nail on the head. Psalm 51, 16. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God you will not despise. Great job. Psalm 51, 16 and 17. That's what this woman had in Luke chapter 7, isn't it? Who again, she hears that Jesus is in the neighborhood in a Pharisee's house. And I find that really, that, you know, did she knock on the door? I don't know how this went down. I mean, Jesus is at the Pharisee's house and she's there. But she came with a broken and contrite heart. And because of her mindset, her understanding who Jesus is, her condition, Jesus is able to say, again, verse 48, your sins are forgiven. Verse 50, your faith has saved you. Again, biblical faith is not just saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's acting upon that belief. It's trusting in him. She trusted in Jesus. And it's interesting when you look throughout the gospel accounts, people who come to him for uh, physical healing, 
but also for what we would call spiritual healing, such as this woman here, they had an absolute trust that they were going to the right place. Now, let me contrast that with something. Uh, the rich young ruler. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Well, I've done that from my youth up. Mark records for us that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I think that's in Mark chapter 10. He loved him. There's one thing you lack. You need to sell what you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. He couldn't do it. He had, I mean, he had everything right, it seems like, as we would say. He had everything down. I've kept all the commandments. I know what the Word of God says, but that is not a broken and contrite heart. He was a good person, and that's what I was saying earlier. You know, you don't have to be a wicked person to be lost. You just have to be outside of Christ. Um, but yeah, so, Connie, I've often wondered how the woman came to be in uh, Simon's house. Now, that makes two of us. <laughs> the text just never tells us. Um, she was there. She was in the right place at the right time. I know that. How do we obtain God's forgiveness? Well, we have to come to God on His terms. That's how. You, forgiveness cannot be obtained. You know, I don't come up with the terms of God's forgiveness. His Word lays that out for us. And so, um, so a passage that was mentioned earlier here, Psalm chapter 51. All right, let's, I'm going to turn back there real quick. Um. And, and incidentally, a, a companion psalm with Psalm 51 is Psalm 32. They go hand in hand. Anyway, Psalm 51, 1 beginning, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. This is a broken and contrite heart. But listen, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. That's where this woman was, I think, in Luke chapter 7. I acknowledge my sins. My sin is always before me. And again, obviously, with Simon's response when he said, listen, um, when he's thinking within himself, what is she doing here and why is he permitting it? She had a reputation, but she had the broken and contrite heart. Is it contrite or is it contrite? I don't know. I've said it a couple different ways, but anyway... Simon didn't have that. He didn't have introspection. He could see her. He could see her faults. He knew that she was a sinner, and she was. That's, I mean, that's not up for dispute, obviously. But her mindset made the difference in her being forgiven, in her faith, um, as Jesus says, saving her. Where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. We have to want to be forgiven. We have to see the need of forgiveness. So, I'm well, I'm still here in Psalm 51. Let me flip back to Luke chapter 7. So I've already pointed this out, and what's stated here in Luke 7, 42, they had nothing to pay with. They're in great debt. The picture here is sin. Every human is in debt in terms of sin. But the good news is that we, we have the capability through a knowledge of the Word of God to get out of debt. And it's not because we deserve it. It's not because God, because God owes us something. And I think that's a great misconception, uh, particularly in connection with, with churches of Christ. And perhaps sometimes it's the way we present it. Perhaps sometimes it's the way we talk. Well, you need to do this and this and this and this. And those things are right. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. You need to repent. You need to be baptized. You need to live faithfully. You know, we can peg down those points, and those are all correct. But perhaps sometimes we stress those to the neglect of we can't repay. There is no way that we can pay the debt that we owe to God. That's grace. That's mercy. I mean, that's, uh, so I think of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For you're all saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. The Greek literally reads there, and that not out of you. It is the gift of God. Salvation is God's gift. That's Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Uh, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
we have to have that understanding. Yes, there are things we must do. Again, this woman came to Jesus. Had she not come to Jesus and bowed at his feet, if she had not manifested her faith, she could not have been forgiven. Same thing's true with us. So uh, I mentioned Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Uh, let me turn over here to Titus. I love Titus chapter 3. I'm just going to start reading here in verse 1. Uh, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men, for we ourselves. Okay, so Paul employs this language where he includes himself in this. For we ourselves um, were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived. Simon, in Luke 7, was deceived, self-deceived. Serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But, and I love that word but throughout the New Testament. I love paying attention to these little words. This, is, this word in the New Testament is called a particle. It, it, in other words, it doesn't really serve, it's not like a noun or a, a verb or an adjective. It's just one of those little words that it, one man described it as kind of the, the ins and outs of the Greek language. But it's adversative. It shows a transition. So here's where we were, but. When the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Why did the love of God appear towards man? not by works of righteousness which we have done. In other words, God didn't send His Son here. God didn't do what He has done because He looked at us and said, you know what, I owe them this. They deserve what I'm getting ready to do for them. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not what, that's not the case at all. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. God had mercy. I mean, I, well, here, so here's an illustration. You know, I, I did this when I was a kid at school. Um, you ever, I don't know if you did this. You played mercy. You'd lock hands with a, well, typically with a friend. Sometimes it was with a bully. And they'd bend your fingers back until you said mercy. Well, uh, the, the mercy of God is the concept of we're not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. So when his mercy, uh, through his mercy, mer mercy, through his mercy, he saved us. Through, here's how it's accomplished, the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit. This washing of regeneration this is a direct connection. This, um, this is talking about being baptized into Christ. Renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. You're born of the water and spirit, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. You're raised up to live with Christ. Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 3. Um, I'm not sure what this comment means, if, if you want to clarify it for me, but negates that was previously spoken. Um, I don't know what you're referring to because I've said a lot, so if you would clear that up, I'll be happy to, <laughs> I'll be happy to address it. I just saw it, and it's been up there for a couple of minutes, it seems like. So going back to Luke chapter 7, we cannot save ourselves. We are not the source of salvation. God is the source of salvation. But if I don't come to Him with a broken and contrite heart... I can't be saved. If I don't do what he requires, I cannot be saved. And I think perhaps one of the great illustrations of this from the Old Testament is Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5, the Syrian commander who had leprosy, told to dip in the Jordan River seven times by the prophet of God. Question, what cleansed him from his leprosy? Was it dipping in the Jordan seven times, or was it God? The answer to those questions is yes, <laughs> It, it, no other body of water would have worked. Dipping eight times wouldn't have done it. Dipping six times wouldn't have done it. But it was because of the grace of God that he even had that message. When it comes to forgiveness, we have to come to God with a broken and contrite heart. Psalm 51 and verse 17. If, if we don't realize our need for salvation, we're never going to seek it. We have to turn to Him in humility, uh, do what He requires of us to do in order to be saved, uh, and so on. 
But again, it's because of his grace and mercy. So here's another passage. So let me get back to this. Luke chapter 7, verse 42. They had nothing to repay. He, so I've got this circled, freely forgave. He freely forgave them both. All right? So that takes my mind. I'm going to flip over real quick to Romans chapter 3, which in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, um, uh, Paul has concluded all men, both Jew and Gentile, under sin. However, being justified freely by his grace, Romans 3.24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that I don't have to do anything to be saved. That means the gift of God, it, salvation is the gift of God. It's a free gift, but I have to access that gift by faith. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so here's the explanation. Thank you for that. The word but renders that which was previously said moot. Yes, I'm sorry, Mark. I, yeah, I get what you're saying now. Absolutely. Obeying. That's right, Miss Jean. There's, there's no way around it. And that's been the case from the beginning of God's dealings with man, and that'll be the case until the Lord comes again. Quite literally, from Genesis chapter 2 to Revelation 22. In every dispensation of time, every human being who has ever been saved has been saved by God's grace through a faithful response. There is no other way to be saved. I think Luke 7 is a great passage on, on this text. Luke 7, specifically, verses 36 through, 36 through 50. They had nothing with which to repay, but he freely forgave them both. That is man's condition. We don't bring anything to the table and say, Hey, God, here's what I've got. Now save me. That's not how it works. We have to respond in faith to what God commands. But it's, it's, and it's like Paul says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 when he was departing from Miletus. He's, he's giving his farewell to the uh, Ephesian elders. He says in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God. That word commend means to turn over, to roll over. I'm handing you over to the word of God, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That's what we have to do. We have to turn ourselves over to God and his grace, and all of that's revealed to us in his word. We have nothing with which to repay God, but He freely forgives us. Romans 3.24, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But that forgiveness can only come on His terms, not on my terms. A lot to learn there. We, I mean, we could, I've already been going for over 34 minutes, and I've got still, I see 17 here on the live stream. I appreciate you hanging with me. We could go in a whole other direction with this. Okay, so we've, we've primarily talked about man's relationship to God. What about man's relationship to man in terms of being forgiven and forgiving? Uh, grace is unmerited favor. Absolutely. We don't deserve it. That's just it. Uh, so in terms of man to man, Jesus addresses that in a couple of different ways. Matthew chapter 5, beginning, I think it's beginning in verse 23. Let me flip over there real quick. I'll just give you the correct references. I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, Matthew 5, let's see, 21 through 26. And this is, the, this is the passage where I am the offender. I'm the guilty one because I've come to worship and I remember my brother has something against me. What's my responsibility? I don't worship. I go to that brother and I fix it first. Matthew 5, 21 through 27. Then you come and offer your gift. And then you flip over to Matthew chapter 18, and now I am the offended. What am I supposed to do? Well, you need to go talk to the elders about that. You need to go talk to the preacher. That's, I mean, that's typically the way we've set things up, and it's wrong. What do we do if we've been offended? Go, Matthew 18, 15, and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You know what I see today, though? And perhaps this is a bit ironic, since I'm on social media. Social media. You know, how many passive-aggressive posts do we see about... Um, and, and posted by Christians. 
well, if you're going to treat me that way, and no names are ever mentioned, but it's, a, it's a very, again, very passive-aggressive, you're going to treat me that way, I'll do you one better. You go to that person alone, period. You don't go to your elders. You don't go to your preacher. Whoever's offended you, you go to them. Now, if that person will not hear you, if they've caused, and this word offend, the Greek word is scandal, skandalos, caused you to stumble. It's a scandal. And they won't repent of having caused you to stumble? Okay, now you need to get a couple people involved because sin's involved. And you need to confirm every word. You need to make sure you got your story straight, you got your facts straight, and this is what's happening. If they won't hear that, then you take it to the assembly. There's a, there's a, I guess pattern's right. There, there's a, there's a way to do this. And it's not by telling others about it. It's not by posting, it's not by venting, as we call it, venting on social media. You got to do it right. Yeah. Miss Jean, correct, and we must be, and we must continually be thankful for His grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Not one of us has anything to pay God to put to to get us out of debt or to put Him in debt to us. He doesn't owe us anything. Luke seven forty two, He freely forgave the debtors. So that should, you know, that should grow our appreciation for God. But I think it should also cause us to look at our relationship with our fellow human. Here's the thing. If you're not right with your fellow man, you can't be right with God. And I'll send you back there to Matthew 5, 21 through 27 for that. Um, let's look at another passage. And this is in Luke 2, and I'll, I'll end it with this one here. There's, I mean, there's so many different directions we could go with this. And I appreciate all of your comments. I always do. Luke 17, Uh, we'll just start here in verse 1. It is impossible, Jesus speaking, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. One of the things that we learn throughout the Bible is this, particularly in regard to the church. If there's going to be trouble, don't be the cause of it. If there's going to be trouble, don't you be the cause of it, all right? So it's impossible that no offenses should come, but when but woe to him through whom they do come. All right, that's a warning to troublemakers. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. Now here's the application. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. There's your responsibility. If there's a sin between two, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, here's a command from Jesus, you shall forgive him. Another text that goes a long way with this is Jesus' discussion with Peter. It's recorded in Matthew 18, beginning at about verse 21 to the end of that chapter. And it it illustrates what we're talking about today. But for forgiveness to be, uh, forgiveness for forgiveness to occur, whether it's my relationship with God or my relationship with my fellow man, I've got to seek it. Notice the conditional terms here. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Okay, and if he repents, forgive him. What's the implication there? In order to be forgiven, I have to repent. That's true with God, and that's true with my fellow man. It's not, hey, I'm going to put my defenses up. Well, you shouldn't take it this way. If somebody approaches me or approaches you and says, hey, you've, you've offended me, I need to repent, period. I mean, that's just it. I think it's the same book that we're reading today that tells us that if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. That if we don't show mercy, we won't be shown mercy. I mean, that's pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? And it would solve a lot of problems. Uh, in our relationships. Oh, greetings from Hyderabad, India. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Well, thank you for joining today. <laughs> All right, so that is, that's what I've got. Luke seven thirty six through 50 teaches us so much about uh, forgiveness, grace, mercy. Um, all right, Wayne, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, 
Yeah. I mean, it was all given to us. And again, Romans 3.24, freely, freely justified by his grace. It's wonderful. That's the gospel. All right, folks, I really appreciate you joining on here today. I would encourage you to like and share these videos. If you have any questions or comments, as always, you can throw it here in the comment section. You can send me a private message on Facebook, and I'll be happy to address it. Uh, you can email me. You can go to our website, mammothspringchurchofchrist.com. You can find my email address there. Um, if you got somebody who'd like to see these videos and they don't do Facebook, when I'm done here, I immediately upload all these videos to YouTube, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ channel, and uh, they can watch them there. Thank you, Miss Jean. I appreciate that. Um, that's it. So the plan is tomorrow, 11 o'clock Central Time, I'll go live and we'll start in Luke chapter 8. So thank you. Thank you for being on here. Brother Lee Davis, good to see you and thank you, sir. Everybody have a good day and we will see you on the next video.